Hey there, this is Seth Wires. We're coming to you from San Francisco, California. This is Build 2016 Edition, and I have some special guests. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. We've talked to you last night, but let's, uh, let's introduce some of our guests. Hi, I'm Brad Green. I work at Google, mm -hmm. and I'm the Eng Director on the Angular project. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Ishka Heavery. I'm a technical lead on the core of Angular 2. Awesome. I'm Anders Heilsberg, and I'm the architect on the TypeScript project. Wonderful. So, for those that don't know Angular because they've been living under a rock as a developer, why don't you give us an introduction of what Angular is, what its goals are, and sort of how people are using it. So Angular 1 was this web platform that really helped people simplify the amount of code that they had to write, just make it conceptually easier to write apps against the DOM. And in Angular 2, we're trying to make this run a lot faster, a lot simpler, but extend Angular to other platforms as well, so native mobile and desktop. Awesome. And so tell us about sort of the history of Angular. How did it come about? What were some of the early goals? And how are those goals sort of morphed over time? Right. So originally, uh, I was thinking of Angular as kind of being the client server where a server would represent the uh, store your data, and a client would allow anybody to kind of turn a simple mom and pop application into a, a site. So maybe you're like a dentistry, and you want to store some quick database, but you don't know how to program. So you just put a little extra markup in HTML, and voila with the backend services we can persist it for you. Um, it, over time, it turned purely into a front-end uh, programming uh, framework. Uh, we kind of lost the backend. But then Google acquired Firebase, and it fits so nicely, and it kind of rejoins the whole vision that we orig or I originally had for the product. That's awesome. And so there's a lot of devs right now using Angular. Do you know what kind of reach Angular has? So we look at the number of sort of 30-day actives on our developer docs, and uh, in we just checked uh, today, and there's about 1.3 million on Angular 1 and about 330,000 on Angular 2. That's, that's quite a reach. I mean, because JavaScript frameworks, like there's one every day. I mean, you yep. know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> For, <laughs> he's, he's laughing. He's like, I know. <laughs> uh, there's like a JavaScript framework every day. But the fact that Angular in, in JavaScript library years is like 2,000 years old, right? How long has it been out? Uh, since <laughs> 2009. And it's interesting. Like that. That Angular 1 number actually bumped to, to like 200,000 folks in the last six months. So it's still growing well. That's amazing. So for those that are using Angular, what's the, how, how do you start looking at Angular and building applications with it? Is it different between 1 and 2? We'll, we'll do that as well. Uh, yeah, so we try to keep the philosophy between Angular 1 and Angular 2 the same. And instead, we try to focus on making changes to the language which would enable tooling. So for example, Angular 1 was actually not very toolable uh, because we had to understand too much of the semantics of a particular directive. And in Angular 2, we kind of focused on making it more toolable, which is in the form of uh, templating syntax or in the form of TypeScript as a, as a language for, uh, for a type system. Um, those are the kind of improvements. Then the other thing we can do because of all these toolability is we have a better understanding of what you're trying to do. And as a result, the code we generate is much faster. So we get speed benefits, um, among other things. So this has got to be a fairly large project in terms of lines of code. In terms of, is it a complex, large project? Tell me about sort of the size of Angular. Yeah, uh, well, Mishko. So we have a, the kind of the core, uh, which is about four or five people working just purely on that. And that's and not including any directive, just purely the templating system. Then around that, we have people who work on uh, directives, with people who work on material design, which is about another four people, right? Uh, we have internationalization, animation team. Uh, it adds up. And there's a kind of a larger community of contributors who are actually not Googlers, but they're uh, out of the community that, like, that contribute and help us design things. It, so it's big. It's big. You know, one of, the, one of the TypeScript anecdotes is that when we switched from plain JavaScript to TypeScript, some of our members actually said, actually, now I understand the code behind Angular. <laughs> and we would all, we'd all work in our own niche, right. and you wouldn't yes. know the whole thing. There's no way to traverse it and understand you know, where the references end up. And I think that's why we, we have you here, because we talked about TypeScript yesterday, and you're saying anytime there's a medium to large project, there are some benefits that you get with TypeScript. Why don't you tell us about those benefits that you received by moving? Was it, a, was it an easy process to sort of move from plain old JavaScript to TypeScript? Why don't you talk about that a little bit? We actually invented our own language in the middle. Yes. Which show you talk about at script. <laughs> yes, so um, we kind of looked at it and we said, we really need types. And we looked at TypeScript, and TypeScript was kind of the, the, the thing that we were looking for. But we also needed annotations and decorators, and TypeScript did not have it. 
So we actually kind of came up with this thing of AdScript, which was basically ES6 plus types plus decorate or plus annotations. And we kind of ran with this for a while until. Uh, <laughs> Andrew I'm trying to remember from, how we ran into each other. Or were you guys one, like, one, like, one, like one, in some I weird cafe, in weird Starbucks <laughs> somewhere? Like, oh, I, no, who made no, I, I think it was after I was on one of the NG cons where you presented and you talked about AdScript, and we were like, wait a second, really? this is like we we can, we already do most of this. In fact, <laughs> yes. we do all of this except for these annotations, and we've been thinking about doing those anyway. So and so. I forget who, who got in touch with who. But, okay, but, there, was, but, there was this interesting person on Twitter who was impersonating AppScript or us or something. They said, TypeScript, <laughs> you're going down. And you guys said, did you say that? <laughs> and we were like, no, we didn't say it. I think that's kind of how I got introduced. <laughs> that, that, he was his, he, you heard his feelings, but it wasn't you. It was someone else. And he came like, yeah. we, we can add stuff. No, but I, I, do, I do remember going. We, we went down. We visited with Google. This, was, this must have been in November of. Uh, uh, 15? Yeah. yeah. Last year? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, 14. 14, yeah. yes. Yeah. And uh, did a little presentation on TypeScript, and then we had like this whole afternoon of engineering where we just sat in the room and shot the, shot the shit about yeah. what, what, what do we need? What do you need? Yeah, what yeah. could we do? And it was like we very quickly discovered we're all made out of the same engineering cloth. Sure. And think about the problems very much the, the same way. And it was, there was a lot of synergy there. And, and, and we basically, you know, came back later and go, okay, we'll, we'll, if you guys are interested in using TypeScript, then we'll commit to doing the stuff that you need. Like in the and end, the pain points of JavaScript are the same irrespective of what company you work for, particularly if you're building a large project, right? Yeah, for sure. And so what were some of the benefits that you saw right away from moving to TypeScript that you really liked? Maybe I'll talk in the project, maybe talk about in the Angular code base. Like, oh, uh, what, like, yes, what, what, what benefits did you see in actually developing it? So to, to start with, uh, TypeScript had a much richer uh, type system, more developed. Uh, we were actually thinking about run type types checking versus a statically type checking system. Uh, by switching to TypeScript, we actually discovered many issues we had. Uh, it also helped with generating documentation. All of a sudden, IDEs and tool support uh, came online. And so there's a lot of these secondary benefits that happen as, as part of the TypeScript. So uh, we were able to understand our code base a lot better. That's awesome. And so what, let me see if I can, help us understand like what the process was. Because as Anders explained it to me last night and over the years, it's TypeScript is just JavaScript. That's right. Plus some other stuff. So did you just say, okay, everything, file rename all to TS, and then go Almost. from there? Almost. So See of red, and then yeah, <laughs> stamp out the errors. It wasn't yeah. quite that bad. So we we had a, a closure compiler which we retrofitted with a type system. Right. Say that again. I, I want a closure, uh, not closure. Um, uh, no, what was that thing called? Uh, tracer. Tracer. Yeah. Tracer compiler, yes. which was a ES6 to ES5 transpiler, which we retrofitted with a type system, which we were calling the type uh, add script. Okay. And so it, it was actually as relatively as simple as renaming the .js to .ts. And because most of the type system was already there and was already verified using the runtime type system, it mostly worked. So there wasn't that much red in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but still, we discovered many places where we had to fix it up and be more in line with uh, what TypeScript was, because actually that was the correct answer to be uh, or originally in there. So, but it wasn't actually that painful. And you mean we found bugs, right? We found things bugs, we had to right? Fix up things bugs, we had to yeah. fix. And uh, it was actually beneficial because uh, it was a, a more expressive uh, type system. That's awesome. And so can you give me an example of the kinds of bugs that you're like, oh, wow, we, what is this? We need to fix this. Can you give me some examples of things that TypeScript services? Sure. Have? So because AdScript was a run type type checking, we could only verify types that we actually fed through the system. So if we actually didn't have a oh, test that actually exercised a particular type, we wouldn't know if that type worked or not. Whereas offline, uh, you know, a static type system can verify things even if you have no tests. That's interesting. So there were there were instances where at runtime everything was verified but if you missed an, a sort of didn't exercise your APIs a certain way you might have missed something and that's where type sort of helped at the static type Correct. level. All right, you were you were going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you encounter moving over to TypeScript. No, well, I wanted to say just like we talked to a lot of people in the development community and I mean, this is the nice thing about TypeScript is you know, all of my existing JavaScript is already valid TypeScript. And I can add types, I mean, saying Anders lines, but um, you, know, you get to add it a little bit at a time, so it's a really easy migration path. And if I come from a background or have some types, I really kind of know what to do with them already. That's awesome. And, and again, 
Like as a developer, I mean, I remember the first JavaScript I wrote was to like make an image rotate. The types of applications, he's laughing at me, I know, I still do image rotate. The types of applications <laughs> we're building now with JavaScript are serious, heavy, full UI, sort of crazy types of interactions. Sure. Tell us about the types of applications that have been built using Angular and the type of craziness that they've been able to do. Ah, oh, it's you know everything. We've got the site called MadeWithAngular.com, uh -huh. where you can see things from like Walmart to like Disney video to um, games, like games. Yeah, um, you know, like from shopping to productivity to like big corporate applications. Um, many airlines run on it. From uh, you know, I know like Virgin America and United. Yeah, United. Um, yeah. So it's, so it's pretty well exercised, pretty well used. So as a dev, let's just say I want to get into so your front end development. What's a good way, what's a good process, what's the good tooling to use in order to get started with Angular? So we, we're at this transition from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Sure. And it kind of depends on what your goals are. If you already have an Angular 1 application, you can certainly continue that for a while. If you're just starting now, though, we really do recommend you go to the Angular 2 branch, which okay. is on TypeScript and has all this nice static analysis ability. Um, and you can just go to angular.io. We've got a getting started guide and a bunch of developer guides that walk you through learning a lot of the concepts by building an application when you do it. And, and those are the documentation that like, people like John Papa and Ward Bell. That's and right. Those folks John and Ward, uh, they actually built a lot of it, and they've guided all of that documentation to a great set. And, and that's awesome. Okay, so. Tell me more about sort of the interaction that you had. How has Angular sort of made TypeScript better, and how has TypeScript made Angular better? Let's start with you. Well, I mean, so Angular is obviously a huge community of users, yeah. and, and to have their stamp of approval on our technology has, has been dramatic in our adoption, right? right. I mean, um, I think also we've learned a lot from Angular's advanced uses of modules, and how do you package and deliver large applications in a robust and scalable way. You know, that how do you deliver the type information that's associated with it when it goes into NPM and all of these different ways that you might want to slice and dice. And, and these guys continue to challenge us on, oh, you, you could still do it. And Mishko was just beating me up on, he wants tree shaking and you know, all sorts of other things, the minification that, that we could do and, and more advanced bundling. And so there's always something. And it's wonderful for us to have a a big, serious team like that, you know, pushing us to the limit at all at all times because this gives us invaluable feedback, right? So that just makes the product better. And I like I like the notion of having a really huge established application sort of exercising TypeScript in a way that maybe no other project can. So let's go vice versa. How has TypeScript sort of helped for the Angular side of things? I think for it let us put together a real platform, because the language, in many ways, we designed together and like, it, like brought the things from AtScript that we wanted into an idealized language for the type of platform we wanted to build. Um, so without it, you know, we, we wouldn't have been able to express dependency injection in a nice way. We get all this wonderful tool support, uh, refactoring, and so like, like you say, for building really large applications, I need, I need some like that super suit that lets me deal with it. So for those that maybe don't know uh, TypeScript, what are some of the features that you immediately started using in Angular that you would suggest if you're going to build sort of a front end type thing, you should really look at these types of things? Maybe Mishka. So obviously we look at uh, annotations or decorators. That's a big thing for us. And right after that, our classes. Um, just being able to have a type, just being able to express your class in a nice, succinct format uh, that you know, is really part of ES6 that, that gives you is a, is a big plus. And then with it comes the ability to express your shape of the class, the properties, which is actually not part of ES6, but you know, hopefully will be there soon. Uh, so those are the, the biggest areas of, of win. The other thing you get out of TypeScript is you, you essentially have the whole ES6 even on ES5 browsers. So you get to use all the, the new fat arrow functions and everything else. It makes just day-to-day -day programming just that much more enjoyable. Actually, I think it's really cool. You get benefits by not even typing types in your JavaScript. You get the DOM APIs now have types, and your IDE can tell you about them. And because Angular is written in TypeScript, like you can see the types for them. You can know if you're passing the right shape of, of classes around. That's awesome. So tell us about, I'm always interested in people's development cycles, because it feels like, with, especially with JavaScript-type applications, 
everyone has their own sort of development loop that I don't know, like, should I use grunt? Should I use gulp? Should I use bundling minification? How does the process go from converting? What, is there a pipeline of linting that you do? Can you tell us a little bit about sort of that whole process and how you set it up? Oh, it's a horrible pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I thought I was the only one. No, everybody goes through this. I was reading this article about how to use you know, Angular build desktop apps with Electron, and it was like five pages of setup. It wasn't like, didn't actually get to building an app, but like now you're ready to go. <laughs> like, oh, oh, thanks, it's been a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so we're addressing this the way a lot of folks have. I'm building a command line interface that wraps all of this from I need to download and install Gulp and TypeScript and SAS and like five other things, then all the things I need for test scaffolding and then from a continuous integration, you know, all the way through to deployment. Uh, so the CLI is in kind of alpha state right now, and okay. it's going to be in folks' hands in a, a month or two. And this is just a CLI where you're going to say, make me a new Angular app with all of the goodness. That's right. Like NPM install Angular CLI, and then you say, you know, Angular CLI new app. Goodness. And then yes. all of a sudden. But yes. am I going to be like, look, in, at Microsoft, we'd have, we've had this problem where I do file new MVC app, and then it's just like... Pfft. There's all of this stuff, and I don't even know what it is. Yeah. Is it going to be like that? So <laughs> most of the stuff, so there are dependencies. Depending on what else you use, there will be directories full of your dependencies sure, from sure. NPM. Um, but we're really trying to make a very nice directory structure that makes sense from the smallest, your little hello world, all the way through to your big app, and that can scale with you. I see. So is, it, is the CLI like something like Yeoman, where you can install features on it as well? Yeah, that's right. And the, you know, the intention is we handle many different types of apps in it, but also for component writers. If I'm building you know, suites of UI components, right. you should be able to do this through the CLI also. So you mentioned there was different sort of aspects or different teams of Angular. Can you tell us what each of those is? For example, you said material design or something like that. Yeah. To me, I was like, hmm, that sounds really fancy. What is that? What OK, so Google actually has a design spec for their desktop and mobile environments, and something that's best to scale well between those different environments. And that, that's just called material design. Okay. So we're building that internally because that's what our Google teams want to use, and some external teams adopt it. But we're also building it with a core of like all the idioms you use to build pop-ups and overlays and all the things that are kind of hard to get right, and we're making them in kind of a neutral format where they can be used by other people writing components also. And we've got this nice Slack channel open with a bunch of the other folks developing these so that we can share concepts and get so them So in essence, lifted. they're like the beginnings of controls, as we would call them. Yeah, in the Windows like sort of prototypical controls. And then we put the look and feel that people like over the top. So you mentioned material design. You said there's the core. And then what other pieces of it are there? Um, there's animation, IE 10N. There's a router. There's, and then there's a team focused on mobile. And in particular, this, this new sort of concept we're calling progressive web apps. And I don't know if you've heard much about this, but the, no, the tell me, Phil. Okay, me well, in. the idea is that I get to, like, it's really hard to get somebody to install your app. Right. And yet, most people spend the time on mobile, so how do I get to them? And it turns out that web apps is still the friction free way you can get people. And if you see where, where are people actually making money, it's still in web apps. But we would like to have a very app like experience. And so these things become more app-like over time, so that where you can get like an installed home screen icon, and your code can actually be installed on the device, so that the next time the user comes to you, it's incredibly fast, because it's already cached. You can do things like push notifications, right. so it can seem like a real app. This is, this is awesome. I mean, it's, it, look, I, I have tried to start many a cool front-end application, but it has been literally like you said, a week of reading this thing, or which one should I even use? And then I go on Twitter, and everyone's very nice. And they say, well, you should use this because this. You should this use this because that. And so one of the challenges that I have is actually starting. Yeah. Right? And so you mentioned that this CLI uh, tool is coming out. What other helps are there other than the getting started? Is there like, you said mentioned the Slack channel. Is there a community of people that have been building these things that we can go to to help? For Angular 2 on Gitter, this is a really good community. You can actually just go to the GitHub Angular 2 page. You can get on Gitter. You can ask questions right there. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is an online community in uh, the, the Google forums. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Gitter is a place where you can you just get your questions answered immediately. OK, so you mentioned something that he's been pushing you on for TypeScript. Can you talk a little bit about that feature that you've been looking for in TypeScript? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so Minifier. Awkward. Uh, yeah. no, it's, so, we, it's so, from day one, we've asked for this thing. But not that we expect you to do everything. Right. 
Well, what is this feature? We'll I, I mean, I'm curious because Anders, sure, man, sure. he's built many languages over. So, many so TypeScript uh, does wonderful uh, type system checking, and it does it in the sense of like you write your code, and we're going to help you verify it, right? But there's the other part of it, which is once the code is written, I need to deliver it to the browser, and so there I need to somehow package it together, right. tree shake it, minimize it. And all of those things is something that TypeScript, uh, as of right now, says, you know, this is not our core expertise. We don't want to kind of take on it yet. And I'm trying to convince Enders that they yeah. should take on it. Because if they do take on it, uh, it will be an easy stepping stone for people, right? Everybody needs a way of delivering the code and minification process. So you step on that step first, and you say, oh, well, since you already are here, if you happen to use types, we can do a better job of minifying it, right? And so then it becomes kind of a nice easing function to become. I mean, and, there, and there is some work that we're, there, there's a work stream right now that we're doing to uh, completely rewrite the back end emitter into a, a a tree transforming emitter so that we can do async await transformations because you sort of have to do that in phases right. where you first go from async to non-async ES6 and then from ES6 to ES5 and, and so forth. And, and once we have that pipeline, it, it certainly becomes more feasible to do some of the things we're talking about here. <laughs> there could certainly be a phase where we, where we use type information to do tree shake because I, that's why Misko is interested in it, why he can't just use external tools. There are plenty of minifiers around, and, right. there, are, and there are also tree shakers, but, but they don't have the semantic knowledge of, of what goes on in the code. The type information is lost by sure. the time they get to the table. Got it. And that means there are certain optimizations they can't do, like for example, all private members of a class, you could minify them down to illegible, very short names, because you know that no one external is going to take a dependency on it. But you can only do that if you know it. And I you only see. know it if you have the type information around. And so that's just one example of, of, of things we possibly could do in the pipeline going forward. It's certainly something where we're going to look at, you know, but we've just we've got many things on, sure. on the plate, and, but, but, but this could very well rise to the top. So I, I, this is the first time I've heard the term tree shakers. What, what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it's, it feels like a fun, what, what, is it, what is it that's doing? It's basically, imagine you have a library with a whole bunch of functions. And now you write a little app, and the, the, the app uses three of those functions. But the library has 100 other functions in it that you don't use. Sure would be nice to get rid of those in your final code, right? Oh. But of course, if those three functions use two of the other ones, and those two use five of those, then you sort of got to shake the tree. And then the only thing that's supposed to fall out are the things that were never referenced. So right? this is, this is a, like a, a and, better form of minification. Well, it's another form of minification, you know, and it's it's like it's something that linkers do for 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 C sharp and or sorry C plus plus code and OBJ files, right? Where where you know you get rid of all the unused code. Mm -hmm. um, so it's by no means a new thing. It's perhaps newer to be doing it on source code, which right. is the which is the runnable artifact in uh -huh. in the JavaScript world. But but in a sense that the, the principles are the same and, and some of the problems you run into are the same, like what do you do with virtual methods, you know, because you don't really know which ones are going to be called. And right. so you have to make some conservative assumptions about that. And so so it's an understood problem space. Mm -hmm. It's just one that we haven't and that's gone interesting. And done yet. That's interesting because JavaScript, I mean, when I started using it, it was, it was kind of a toy language back in the 90s when I started using it. But now there's serious, serious oh, yeah. applications being built on it. And we're, we're like tree shakers. I, I knew that the compiler in C started to get rid of code that you didn't use. But now that we're moving that into JavaScript, that's amazing. So future of JavaScript, what do you guys see about that? in that realm. I don't know, we're actually working on the TC39 committee now. I never thought we would, but so we're working on helping make sure decorators make it through mm -hmm. and, and zones, which Mishko's been working on a lot. So I think we're taking a bigger role trying to make it really optimal for the types of frameworks people want to work on. That's awesome, and TypeScript always onward and upward, right? Well, I mean, we, we've sort of continuously had the, 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 the notion that we we want to deliver static types on top of JavaScript, but we're not in it to invent a brand new language. We're in it to augment an existing ecosystem with those things that are missing to provide great tools and, and scalability, right? So and we're going we're gonna to stick to that. Awesome. So just to finish up, we have about 30 seconds. Why don't you tell us sort of again where the Angular website is and where people go, can go to get yeah. started. Just go to angular.io. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you can actually get to it from the AngularJS homepage, but go straight to angular.io, and then right in the middle, getting started. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with us. I love seeing sort of the synergy on, on how we're making each other better. It's great uh, to do that. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Seth Juarez. This is Channel 9 and Build 2016. See you next time. Take care.